Craig. Good evening, everybody. My name is Doreen. I'm a very grateful recovering addict. Hi, Doreen. And it's a, a joy to be here tonight. And that's for real. Um, I don't know, when I look around the room, you know, and, and I see all the kids sitting in here, it, it, it really does something to me. You know, because uh, I remember when I first come in here and I first started going uh, to 12 step meetings, they didn't have too many of us addicts in rooms. In fact, they didn't have any Narcotic Anonymous meetings here in D.C. at all, you know. So those of us that were looking around trying to get ourselves together, we had to go to another 12-step program, you know. And uh, at first, they act like they really didn't want us in there, you know. In fact, the sponsor that I got, it was a sponsor, but I knew that he had used drugs before, you know. And uh, he took me to a meeting, an AA meeting, and my first meeting I went to, I was really hurting, really hurting inside, you know. And I was at the point where I was sick and tired of being sick and tired. And I did want a new way of life. But I didn't know how to begin to get myself together, you know. I have tried numerous of times of going to the hospital to detox, going to jail, kicking my habit. But when I come back out, there was still an empty void that was there. All I knew was that I wanted to do the right thing, but how was I going to get started with doing the right thing? Because for the last 18 or 19 years, all I knew was being out there in the street, hustling, prostituting, soliciting, you know, stealing, lying, doing anything I could to get over, to keep money's coming in to keep me supported in the drugs that I needed. I didn't know anything about being around square folks, you know, folks, as we call them, people who work, who take care of business like they're supposed to take care of business, their rent and their obligations and things, you know. These were square people to me, you know. And it goes to show you how sick we really are because when we're in our act of addictive, Addiction. This is how we really see other people who are really trying to live their life. And every time I got out of jail or I got out of uh, the hospital, I would try to get me some kind of little job. Here I am, unskilled, uneducated, not knowing which way to turn. You know, I'd always wind up getting me some kind of job as a salad girl or working in a hotel as a chambermaid or something like that, you know. And I, I, I just didn't like that type of job. I didn't like that type of job to save my life. But I didn't know a damn thing else, you know. I didn't go no further than eighth grade in school and I didn't complete that. And then when I was in school, I didn't even try to do anything while I was there, you know, because my mind was always tripping off somewhere else. My last and final bout with hard drugs was back in June of 68. And I never want to forget that because it was a horrible time for me. And I can say that it's only through the grace of God that I'm standing up here now because I got locked up for my last and final time. And I went over to Women's Detention Center and I laid over there for eight days. And eight days, instead of me getting better, I got worse. They took me from Women's Detention Center over to D.C. General Hospital. And there they found out I had a heart murmur. Also, they found out I had a disease that was in the first stage of syphilis. And if I stand up here tonight, and if I tell you that I knew what was wrong with me and I was about to go somewhere and see about myself, I'd be telling you a damn lie because I did not know what was wrong with me and I wasn't about to go anywhere to see about myself. So you see, I know it's only through the grace that I'm standing up here. Because if I had stayed out there like I was, I'd probably be 
a blundering idiot by now I was just to eat my brains up or either I'd be a dead woman because I just didn't care. I come out of there and I wanted to get my life together. But I only knew one thing, going back down to the corner of 14th and T, 7th and T, or down on 7th Street somewhere. I didn't know anything else to do. I had long since disconnected myself from my family, you know, because they didn't understand me. Hell, I didn't even understand my own self, so how could I think that they would understand me? I come out of there, and for the first time in my life, I begin to start getting real with myself. I said, Doreen, you need to find something to do with yourself. And the first drug program that was open here in D.C., they called it Day Track. And they had a nice building on 13th Street, real model building, you know, where you could see a psychiatrist and, and, and go there and, and, and have somebody to talk to. They try to get you a job and, and, and all this type of stuff, you know. So I said that I wanted to try. I really wanted to try. And I went to that center. And I run into a psychiatrist there. And I begin to sit down and I begin to start talking to the psychiatrist. And you know how we are when we don't know how to talk. I did not know how to hold a decent conversation with anybody. Because out there in the street, all I knew was, hey, motherfucker. <laughs> Hi, bitch. Where you going, motherfucker? Kiss my ass. You know, that was my everyday bilingo, you know? That's the way we talk to each other. Fuck you! You know? I don't give a goddamn. Uh, you know, well, I knew that by heart, you know? But when you sit down and you begin to start asking Doreen something about Doreen, you know, well, what the hell you want to know something about me for? You know, I don't want you in my goddamn business. You know, ain't nothing wrong with me. I'm all right if y'all just leave me alone. And that's the way I felt. Somehow or another, I kept going down to that center. And for a whole year, I did not use any drugs. But what happened, I started drinking real heavy. And we are people with addicted personalities. We go from one extreme to another extreme. A lot of us will stop using, and I've heard people say, you mean to tell me that you don't do nothing? Or you, don't, you don't take a beer or stick a reaper or do, do nothing? <laughs> Hell no, I don't do nothing today. And that's the way I was. I was really empty. And I had a void there that needed to be filled. And the only way I knew how to feel that boy was to go to the corner and cop. But I was determined that I was not going to the corner and cop. I prayed to my God and I asked him to give me the strength that I needed. I was in a halfway house for over a year. I was afraid to leave out of that pr protective environment because I did not know what to do until I run into my sponsor. He took me to my first AA meeting and it was a speaker's meeting just like this. And there was a man there that was talking. And this man looked like any kind of professional you ever want to see. He looked like a professor or so. And this man was standing up there telling his story. And I said, this man got to be lying. As good as he looked. You understand? He was talking about how people was kicking him in his ass, spitting on him and children, throwing stones and rocks at him, and how he was afraid to cross the street. And I began to start listening to this man. And something began to come to me. Said, Doreen, all you've got to do is give this thing just half to try. And I began to start going to meetings. Because, because I was so glad to be in a room full of people that were so willing and ready to talk about themselves. She 
See, I'd always been around people who were willing and ready to talk about everybody else but themselves. And I was with that bunch. I'd talk about you like a dog. But I didn't want you to say a goddamn thing about me. <laughs> you, stay out of my, you stay out of my business. <laughs> and I began to start coming around to these meetings. And at first, I'm talking to the newcomer now. When I first come into these meetings, it was so happy. Everybody was laughing and smiling. It was just like a big party. I was running around and I was talking shit to everybody and sitting down at the beaches and everything, you know. I was on a pink cloud. Because I felt safe in these rooms. Then things began to happen to me in my life. The storms begin to rain. <laughs> Things begin to shake and tumble around me. And I said, Good God Almighty, what is this? <laughs> and I'm here to tell you tonight there is no growth without pain. And the only way out of this thing is you've got to go through it. There's no easy way around this thing. You don't come in here and just automatically take off and everything will be all right. You got to come in here and you got to work a little. You're going to have to go through some changes. You're going to have to be some storms that got to come in your life. For how would I appreciate the sunshine if it wasn't for the rain yesterday? There's got to be some rain and some storms in your life sometime. We all want it to be so easy. We don't want to have to deal with nothing but just go on. But that's not life. That's not the way life is. They say try not to make no major decisions for at least a year in here. And my first year, I made a major decision. It was about a week or so before my first anniversary. I was married. And my husband was still practicing. And Lord knows I'm a woman in the prime of life. And I can't change men like you change streetcars. <laughs> but I had a decision to make with this man. And the decision I had to make was I had to let him go. Because we weren't about the same things. He was still practicing and I was trying to get my life together. And we was like a roller coaster, up and down. Because I did not want to let go. Until it came to me and my sponsor told me, you have got a decision to make, and can't nobody make that decision for you but you. I want him to tell me what to do. You know how we are about making decisions. You know, if you tell me what to do, then if it don't come out like I want it to come out, then I can put that shit on you. You told me to do it. He said, no, I am not making that decision for you. You are going to have to make that decision, and I don't want to hear no more about that shit. I said, well, who in the hell do he think he's talking to? But it was the gospel truth. I had a decision to make. And I got down on my knees. And I began to pray. And I asked God to give me the strength that I needed to do what I had to do. And i never forget, I went over to D.C. General Hospital to a meeting. It was a real cloudy, one of them really good sleuthwood days. You know, one of them days where sleuthwood could get you and just hug you and just keep you rocking, you know, in a pity pot. <laughs> and I went over to that meeting. And in that meeting, it was the all-women's meeting in detox. And in that meeting, there was a little old lady out of all the women that was there. And this little old lady was just round up and crunched up like this 
and just rocking back and forth. This little woman looked like she must have been about 80 or 90 years old. And I went and I sat down at that meeting. I can't tell you what the topic was, what they were talking about or nothing. Because my eyes was focused on that little old lady. And what was coming to me was, what is a little old lady like this woman doing sitting in detox this morning? Where she should be in somebody's rocking chair with a Bible in her hand, praising God for the life he didn't give her and for how long she'd have been here. And I kept looking at that little lady and my eyes could not wander away from that little lady. And after a while, I did not see that little lady anymore. That little lady turned into Doreen. And something come across me and I said, oh my God. And that something that come across me was, if you don't get yourself together, there by the grace of God, go Doreen. I say, now what has this woman got that she's holding on to, that she's blessing to, that's got her here and detox this morning? And if I don't let go of this shit that I got to let go of, there by the grace of God, go on. I jumped up in that meeting. I said, find ya! <laughs> I run out of that meeting, and I run home, and I had a little red, raggedy Toyota. And I rushed in my apartment, rushed past my husband, just went to the bedroom, and started pulling down my clothes. He said, what are you doing? I said, I'm going. He said, you going where? I said, I am leaving. He said, you mean tell me you're going to leave me? I said, I have got to go. I got me a few dishes and a few pots and pans and an iron board and an iron and packed all that shit up in my car. He looked at me. He said, you must be crazy. You're going to leave me? I said, I have got to go. He said, well, fuck you, you black nappy in here. <laughs> Get the fuck on, who needs you? I remember the time them was fighting words. But instead I stopped and I looked at it and I said, huh, black? Yes, I am. Never hear I said, brother, you told the truth. I said, but now when you said I was trying to be holier than thou, Evidently, you're looking at me out of the eye of being all right. So I'm living here this morning. And I left. Me and my husband were separated for five years. I got in this program, and I got in here to work on Doreen. And that's what I did. I come in here to work to get my head together, not my ass. And I jump right in the middle of this thing. And I start listening to you people. And you people start shaping me up little by little by little by little. And I begin to follow a direction and do what I had to do. And I thank God for that, and I thank God for you people. After five years of being separated from my husband, somebody come to me one day and told me, said, Doreen, say your husband is at the VA hospital. I said, really? They said, yeah. He's in detox up there. I said, well, good for him. My husband celebrated nine years last month. So I'm saying all this to say, you don't know what you got to do. A lot of us come in here and we want to fix it for everybody else but ourselves. All you got to do is come in here and do what you got to do for you. And whatever you do, it will spread aboard. And a lot of us come in here with the notion about, I love this. 
I love my husband. I love my kids. I love, if you ain't got no love, how in the hell can you give some love? Mm. You got to learn how to love first. And charity, they tells me, begins at home. Until you start learning how to love yourself so you can spread that love. A lot of us come in here and we want everything the way we want it to be. It's not going to be the way you want it to be all the time. There are going to be some ups and some downs. No doubt there's some people in here tonight who might be going or who might be in the midst of a storm. But I'm here to tell you tonight that if you are in the midst of a storm, all you got to do is just hold on and just rock with it. <laughs> and before you know it, the storm will be them past right on over. And you can say, hallelujah. And the more storms you go through with, the stronger you'll be able to get. A lot of us, a lot of feeling and emotional people. But I'm here to tell you that when you start hurting and you start going through with them feelings and them emotions, just start rubbing and soothing the feeling and the emotions and say to yourself, it's going to be all right. It's going to be all right. Because he didn't bring me this far not to leave me now. We got to come in here and we got to love one another. We got to learn how to respect one another. See, we come in here not knowing a damn thing but thinking we know everything. We come in here dragging our asses. And as soon as we be around a few little 24 hours, then we begin to get real perky. <laughs> <laughs> the vim and shit begin to start rising. <laughs> like we got it all together. Then somebody's telling us how good we look. You know, damn girl, you done been around here since that time. You really looking good there. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> then we get to get so damn cute <laughs> that we begin to sit up in the meeting and we don't have no problem. Nothing at all. You got something you want to say? No, I think I passed. <laughs> Because Joe Blow over in the corner just said that he really and truly digs you. <laughs> and that's when you got your little flimsy tight skirt on and, and you want to switch your little ass around and everything's all right now. But I'm here to tell you tonight, it's time enough for all that. It's time enough for all that. Because all of us come in here as sick as we can be. And I don't know why y'all can't tell a goddamn difference. Women, these men are just as sick as you are. <laughs> and men, these women are just as sick as you are. And a lot of us have never had any wholesome relationships anyway. And we all need help in that area. And I say, come in here first and start dealing with you and your shit. Because we come in here with a whole lot of shit. And it takes time to unlearn and start relearning all over again. And we don't help each other 
when we start whispering yeah. those sweet little nothing in each other's ears to get your ego up, to make you feel good. See, today I know man can make me feel good. I depend on the God of my understanding. I cannot put no dependence in man because man will let me down. He's only vulnerable. I've got to put my dependence in the God of my understanding. I, God gives me only one day and I try to live that day to the fullest. Each day that he gives to me, fresh, brand new, unused, it's a Doreen's day to do whatever she desires to do with that day. And I decide just to step right on our little faith and to keep on going. You got to get in here. You got to read your literature. You got to get into the book, the basic text, and begin to learn about your steps. And I don't mean to learn them where you can just quote them by bait them. I mean to learn them, to incorporate them into your life today. They say that this is a lifetime program, and it is. You've got to learn how to follow direction. And when time comes for you to have a relationship, God will fix that up for you. You will have one. But learn how to be a friend to a man for once in your life. And then learn how to be a friend to a woman for once in your life without deciding you got to go to bed. Because there's too many things that's happening around here now. And we need to help each other. We come in here and we learn to live. We live and then we die. It's simple as that. And today, I don't have no time for a whole lot of BS. Because I have come a mighty, mighty long way and got even a greater way to go. And I always say, God, don't move my mountain. But just give me the strength to continue to climb. Don't take away my stumbling blocks, but just leave me all around. And if I had not come in this fellowship, I never would have learned how to follow any direction. I never would have been able to get to the point that I am at now. And it's only by coming in here and opening up to you people and telling you people that I need help. And we all can help one another by reaching out to one another. My husband had a real bad heart attack a couple of years ago. The doctor said that he wouldn't last a year. But he's still pumping. He's still going on in spite of. And I thank God for that. I thank God for the time that we have had together. Because I'm a woman 53 years old. And I'm just beginning to learn what a wholesome relationship is. I was in this fellowship for 10 years before I even had any sex. A lot of people might say, wow. <laughs> <laughs> but I found out that I wasn't a hot tomato after all. And I definitely can't have no sex now since my husband had a heart attack. I don't want to kill his ass. <laughs> I tell him, 
way them coming over here that I had a porno film on there last night. And he come peeping around in my room. Oh, well, come on in, honey. Lay down. He said, you'll never kill my ass in <laughs> Well, see, we can talk to one another like that today. If I walk by him, if I get a little pat on the cheek, I said, thank you. <laughs> Keep walking and turn the other one. <laughs> but life is so much more beautiful today. And all I can tell you kids in here tonight is to keep the faith. Believe. Believe without a shadow of a doubt that it's going to be all right. And prayer really and truly helps. And like I say, when you're going through a storm, just hang on. Because it will soon be over. You heard me say that I was uneducated, unskilled. I went back to get my GED and missed it by one point in math. I'm going back after it again as soon as I get back there and study with that math. I have a top-notch job now. But I'm a parole officer's assistant working in, in the federal court. I've been there now for 13 years. And the mother has a secretary today. The mother curves a badge in the pocketbook today. So you can't tell me what can happen if you only believe. And if you get up off your duster and do what you got to do. A lot of things we want to fall in our lives, but you're going to have to get up and you're going to work for it. And when you work for it, whatever it is that you get, you'll appreciate it more. All you got to do is keep the faith. Keep coming back. And asking God to give you the strength that you need to do whatever you got to do. And remember that you cannot change people, places, and things. The only change that's got to be made is with yourself. And if you're having problems out of your parent, your husband, your boyfriend, on your job. Just remember, you're the one that's changing, they're not. And hang on in there and do what you got to do. And believe me, the storm will soon pass over. You got to run and crawl after this thing the same way that you run and you crawl to get what you had to get to keep you functioning out there. Tell this program to me now. It's like I wear it. I wear this program like a garment. And it just fits, and it just sways all around. But see, I can't take the credit for this. I got to give the credit back to the God of my understanding and you people. Because I say, unless I can see the goodness of the Lord amongst the land of the living, then I do believe. And when I walk into a room like this, I see the goodness of the Lord, and I do believe. I want to thank y'all.